interesting topic that we're going to talk about tonight. Um, and uh, the topic is actually the separation of church and state, right? So this is, uh, this is interesting uh, in, in that here we are, we're, we're coming up here on Memorial Day. Is, this is a time where we remember, um, you know, the sacrifices that, are, uh, that have been laid out for our country to give us the freedoms and uh, everything that we enjoy. And those freedoms are slowly being taken away, right? Well, you know, how many of you have heard this, this phrase, like, pretty much your entire life? I have. All the time, right? You know, separation of church and state. You know, I remember that this was why all of a sudden we, you know, we couldn't, you know, pray in school or why we stopped singing, you know, my country tis of thee. You know, I, I remember all this stuff that was, that was going on at, at this time. And so it was because they were overtly religious statements where everyone would say, oh, no, no, no. Those have their place in the church, but not in the state, right? And so... Um, you know, so if you're going to a public school, those things can't cross over. Well, you know, none of this really just set well with me. And so we've got a lot of things coming up. We've got a lot of things that are going on behind the scenes. We've got things that are, that are going on even now that are trying to take away the sovereignty of our country. Um, so for those of you who don't know, uh, the WHO, they're actually voting. It could be sometime in any time within the next seven hours or so. Uh, I know Alan and I were talking about this before, but it could be one of those things where as nations gather, they could actually vote to give over our sovereignty um, so that the WHO would have authority to make decisions about what's going on um, you know, during the next pandemic, because believe me, there's going to be another one, right? So there's there there's there's things that are going on that we we need to understand, and we need to understand what this stuff is is all about. Is this truly correct? No, it's not. It's not. It's all a big lie. Every single bit of it is a big lie. And so what we're going to do, we're going to walk through this thing, and we're going we're gonna to talk about it a little bit. And in, um, so strap on a little bit. There's a lot of history that's going on here. Uh, and I want to be able to share it, but I want you to understand where this comes from, what the true roots of our country are, and then um, what we can do to confront this stuff, all right? So, um, where did this come from? Where did the phrase, the separation of church and state, come, come from? Well, the origin of, of the expression, the separation of church and state, is found in a letter from Thomas Jefferson written to the Danbury Baptist Association in 1802. The association had written a letter to the president voicing concern that their state constitution lacked specific protections of religious freedom. So Jefferson responded to this letter, and he's um, and he basically referenced uh, the establishment clause that's in the First Amendment and uh, the free uh, and that free exercise clause. And here's what he said: He says, "I contemplate with sovereign reverence that act of the whole American people which declared that their legislature should make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof, thus building a wall of separation between church and state." And this is what Jefferson said, right? So what did Jefferson actually mean by this? Well, the metaphor of a wall of separation, it wasn't intended to say that the religion should not influence opinion on government issues. Rather, it was used to affirm free religious practice for, for, for citizens, right? So, well, as we've heard, you know, a lot of progressive thinking, uh, people would want us to believe that the Constitution includes a wall of separation of church and state, but it's not found in there at all. So the First Amendment says, Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. The founders wanted to ensure that a citizen didn't have to belong to a certain church or religion in order to become a government official or even the president. This is clear, and look at how Jefferson actually ends this letter, okay? So this is the actual letter, and I'm not going to read through the, the, the whole thing. I highlighted uh, what he 
says, thus building of a wall of the separation between church and state. But he basically goes through the whole thing, but look at how he ends it. He says, I reciprocate your kind prayers for the protection and blessing of the common father and creator of man, and I tender you for yourselves and your religious association assurances of my high respect and esteem. So he actually say, I reciprocate the prayers that you were telling me that I'm praying for you. I am also praying for you. Okay, so here he is. He's he's a man. Uh, he he is the uh, he's the president of the United States, and here he is talking about praying for these for these individuals. So he definitely was not you know talking about a separation of church and state there, right? So and he wrote that letter in January first, eighteen o two, and you'll see this this reference, but they never referenced the full letter. They never reference the full letter. They always just pick out that one phrase or that one paragraph where he, where, where he does that. So this is the, the, the full letter. All right? And so what's, what's been done with this phrase? Well, the, the flawed wall of the separation of church and state uh, application was hijacked from Thomas Jefferson's letter for the purpose of finding a legal justification to remove God from government and therefore society. All right, that was the true purpose of this. It was to remove God from all public areas. All right, well, this really wasn't even acted upon until 1947. So until then, the Bible was widely used in public education and prayer was common in schools. I mean, it was common for people to stand up and pray. Now, even then, they didn't force people to pray. They just made you stand in reverence, right? And so you didn't have to pray, but you were made to stand reverence while other people prayed and they encouraged you if you have some other religion you can you can pray to your own religion or what or whatever but all this was there but the bible was commonly used as a textbook in, in school so well in 1947 the supreme court attempted to define what it means that phrase the establishment of religion clause in the first amendment so it was justice hugo black writing for the court and he held and this is, his, this is his finding. He says, neither a state nor the federal government can set up a church. Neither can pass laws which aid one religion, aid all religions, or prefer one religion over another. In the words of Thomas Jefferson, the clause against the establishment of religion by law was intended to erect a wall of separation between church and state. And this was the case of uh, Everson versus, versus the Board of Education. All right, and this was one of the key findings. This, this decision by uh, Justice Black, it, that's the one that opened the door for every lawsuit that sought to remove Christianity from the public square. It is interesting to note that almost every case targets Christianity and Christianity alone and not some other religion. All right? So that's what we have to be aware of. So, and then a couple of other key cases, and this, this is just a few that right around the same time, McCollum versus the Board of Education in 1948 was a landmark United States Supreme Court case related to the power of a state to use its tax-supported public school system to aid religious instruction. So that's basically saying you can't use schools to, um, for religious instruction. So you can't have Sunday school classes meet, at, meet, at, meet during school times or, or in schools or in, and things like that. So this was, this was one of those key cases. So in Engel uh, versus uh, Vitale in 1962, the, the Supreme Court ruled that school-sponsored prayer in public schools violated the Establishment Clause of the First Amendment. <clears throat> so that's one of the key ones that actually removed prayer from, from schools. And then uh, Murray versus... Uh, Kurtlet in 1963, in which the lower court had found that Bible reading in schools is unconstitutional. So you see a direct pattern, and these are just a few. You can actually start looking at, because of that first landmark case in 1947, where the Supreme Court defined what it meant to have a separation of church and state, that was the one that everything else hinged upon, and why uh, why it started to, um, to creep into our our society, where they started getting Christians out of the public square and relegating them into, into their own little community, so to speak, right? 
So what's the true purpose of, of, of that phrase? So they use the separation of church and state to argue against a national religion, but what they're really separating is God, not church, from government and promoting secularism. The state actually becomes God. So in other words, we become an atheistic society, so what is the moral standard that governments use to legislate and enforce laws? Whose morality guides our lawmakers and to, and to do what's right for the common good of society? What is that that's guiding them now? If we've removed God and we've removed anything to do with the Lord from our, um, from our vocabulary, from our lawmakers, what is it that's guiding them? It has to be the God of this world, right? So this unconstitutional interpretation has led to, cur to cultural chaos where truth is relative, right and wrong are ambiguous, and killing is legal. All of these things stem from this. So this is a good little um, cartoon that kind of points it out right here. So, you know, the separation of church and state according to, to conservatives where, you know, we're saying we actually pay no heed to what's going on with the state and we are absolutely, you know, worshiping the Lord or really according to uh, liberals, separation of church and state according to them is the state is all powerful. We are worshiping the state, right? You know, that's the one that provides for us. That's the one that, that, that gives us everything that we need. So I thought it was a perfect cartoon to kind of illustrate that. So how do we know the Founding Fathers did not intend this separation? Well, let's talk a little bit about the faith of our founders. So now this is where the history lesson comes in, okay? Our Founding Fathers did not intend for the citizens of this country to live in a secular society, but in a good society as defined by Judeo-Christian values. Because American history is mainly being taught by secular humanists in our public schools, there's a popular perception that America's founding fathers were atheists, uh, agnostics, and deists. You'll hear a lot of people talk about George Washington being a deist. Anything could be further from, from the truth. Absolutely not. Um, there are testimonies. I was reading all kinds of different stuff. His granddaughter was talking about, it. well, actually it was his step-granddaughter, was talking about before meeting uh, with Congress, he would, he would actually kneel down with his Bible open in supplication and prayer before the Lord, before he went in to meet with Congress. I mean, amazing stuff talking about this, right? So the problem is that the approximately 250 founding fathers, a few writings and excerpts from speech and letters of a few are used as proof, and it's just simply not true. And it's not fair either. Whatever questions and concerns some of the founding fathers had with miracles in an age of reason, and this is Benjamin Franklin mainly, um, and a few others, no one completely denied a supreme being who, who ruled over or guided the affairs of man. The Bible was appealed to, uh, in, to uh, in support of many political positions. And a matter of fact, Benjamin Franklin, at the end of his life, when he was writing about um, you know, Jesus Christ, he said, he said, you know, um, he said, I absolutely believe in God. And he says, what I'm concerned about is the, uh, is the divinity of Jesus Christ. However, and he knew he was on his, on his way out. He says, however, I feel that question. He said, I'm not going to devote in intellectual power to that question because I, I feel like it's going to be answered for me very soon anyway. And so it was like one of those, he, he never denied it. He just had a question about the divinity of Jesus, okay? So that was the one, that was one of the founding fathers that where his intellect got in the way of, of what he could observe around him. But he definitely believed in a creator. So let's, let's look at George Washington, okay? These are some quotes from our founding fathers, okay? So just, um, he was a judge. He was the member of the Continental Congress, commander-in-chief of the Continental Army, president of the Constitutional Convention, first president of the United States, and father of our country, right? So these are quotes from him. He says, you would do well to wish to learn our arts and ways of life, and above all, the religion of Jesus Christ. These will make you a greater and happier people than you are. 
And here's another one. While we are zealously performing the, duty, the duties of good citizens and soldiers, we certainly ought not to be inattentive to the higher duties of religion and to the distinguished character of patriot. It should be our highest glory to add the more distinguished character of Christian. All right, the blessing and protection of heaven are at all times necessary, but especially so in times of public distress and danger. The general hopes and trust that every officer and man will endeavor to live and act as becomes a Christian soldier defending the dearest rights and liberties of his country. So this guy does not sound like a deist to me or, or, or anything else like that. He sounds like he's someone who believes in Christ. Now, one of the things that is really important to note that our founding fathers at this time, because we were gathering in so many different nations, religions, and, um, and um, sects of Christianity and things like that, they tried to stay away from language that was a hot button topic to start, you know, that, that would start controversy. So they, they did not put into writing, you know, very, um, you know, very straightforward language. And, and as you can see in here, I mean, Back then, they had a gift with language. I mean, they truly did. I mean, I'm stumbling over this because I'm just like, who actually talks like that? Well, they did. So, um, but I'm like, I'm like, but it, it, they they really tried to steer away from language that was going to start, you know, um, um, unrest and un unease. So that's why they didn't, you know, they weren't all out there, you know, talking about things. But as you'll see, there's there's a lot of it. So. Uh, John Hancock, he was the first signer of the Declaration of Independence. Resistance to tyranny becomes the, the Christian and social duty of each individual. Continue steadfast with a proper sense of your dependence on God. Nobly defend those rights which heaven gave and no man ought to take from us. Wow. Wow. That's not mincing words. Samuel Adams, signer of the Declara Declaration of Independence and father of the American Revolution. And as it is our duty to extend our wishes to the happiness in, of the great family of man, I conceive that we cannot better express ourselves than by humbly supplicating the supreme ruler of the world that the rod of tyrants may be broken to pieces and the oppressed made free again, that wars may cease in all the earth, and that the confusion, uh, the, the confusions that are and have been among nations may be overruled by promoting and speedily bringing on that holy and happy period when the kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ may be everywhere established and all people everywhere willingly bow to the scepter of him who is prince of peace. And he wrote this as the governor of Massachusetts, okay? Proclamation on the day of fast, March 20th, 1797. So you see, and in the infancy of our country, here he is as governor and as a signer of the Declaration of Independence, he is boldly proclaiming his faith in our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. All right, John Quincy Adams. Uh, six U.S. president. The hope of a Christian is inseparable from his faith. Whoever believes in the divine inspiration of the Holy Scriptures must hope that the religion of Jesus shall prevail throughout the earth. Never since the foundation of the world have the prospects of mankind been more encouraging to that hope than they appear to be at this present time. And may the, and may the associated distribution of the Bible proceed and prosper till the Lord shall have made bare his holy arm in the eyes of all nations, and that all the ends of the earth shall see the salvation of our God, Isaiah 52.10. So, no one's missing words here. All right, William Penn, founder of Pennsylvania. I do declare to the whole world that we believe the scriptures to contain a declaration of the mind and will of God in and to those ages in which they were written, being given forth by the Holy Ghost, moving in the hearts of holy men of God, that they ought also to be read, believed, and fulfilled in our day, being used for reproof and instruction that the man of God may be perfect. They are a declaration and testimony of heavenly things themselves Themselves, and as such, we carry a high respect for them. We accept them as the words of God himself. So there he is, William Penn talking about the Bible. Roger Sherman, 
signer of the Declaration of Independence and, the, and of the United States Constitution. I believe that there is only one living and true God existing in three persons, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, the same in substance, equal and in power and glory, and that the scriptures of the Old and New Testaments are a revelation from God and a complete rule to direct us of how we may glorify and enjoy him. I believe that God, having elected some of mankind to eternal life, did send his own son to become man, die in the room instead of sinners, and thus to lay foundation for the offer of pardon and salvation to all mankind, so as all may be saved who are willing to accept the gospel offer. Also, by his special grace and spirit, to regenerate, sanctify, and enable to persevere in holiness all who shall be saved, and to procure in consequence of their repentance and faith in himself, their just Justification by virtue of his atonement as the only meritous cause. See? Benjamin Rush, signer of the Declaration of Independence and ratifier of the Constitution, the gospel of Jesus Christ prescribes the wisest rules for just conduct in every situation in life. Happy they who are, who are enabled to obey them in all situations. Patrick Henry, ratifier of the U.S. Constitution. It cannot be emphasized too strongly or too often that this great nation was founded not by religionists, but by Christians, not on religion, but on the gospel of Jesus Christ. For this very reason, peoples of other faiths have been afforded asylum, prosperity, and freedom of worship here. Isn't that incredible? And then look, let's look at some of the architecture that's in Washington, D.C., okay? The Washington Monument. Ceremony on December 6, 1884, the aluminum capstone was placed atop the monument. The east side of the capstone has the Latin phrase, Laos Dio, which means praise be to God. The cornerstone of the Washington Monument includes a holy Bible, which was a gift from the Bible Society. If you walk inside the monument, you'll see a memorial plaque from the Free Press Methodist Episcopal Church. On the 12th landing, you'll see a prayer offered by the city of Baltimore. On the 12th landing, you'll see a memorial offered by Chinese Christians. There is also a presentation made by Sunday school children from New York and, and, Phil and Philadelphia on the 24th landing. The monument is full of carved tribute blocks that say, Holiness to the Lord, search the scriptures, the memory of the just is blessed. May heaven to this union continue its, bene its beneficence. In God we trust and train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. So that's just the Washington Monument, okay? So the U.S. Capitol Building. The religious imagery in the rotunda is significant. Eight different historical paintings are on display. Among the paintings are portrayals of baptisms, prayers, and blessings, including the baptism of Pocahontas. Throughout the Capitol building, there are references to God and faith. In the Cox Corridor, a line from America, the beautiful is carved into the wall. America, God shed his grace on thee, and crown thy good with brotherhood from sea to shining sea. And the House of Chamber is the inscription, In God We Trust. Also in the house chamber above the gallery door stands a marble relief of Moses, the greatest of the, the, greatest of tw of the 23 lawgivers and the only one who actually has his full face. Uh, and at the east entrance to the Senate chamber, there are, there are the words, Anuit uh, Coeptus, which is Latin for God has favored our undertakings. The words in God we trust are also written over the southern entrance. In the, capital, uh, in the Capitol's chapel is a stained glass window depicting George Washington in prayer under the inscription in God we trust. And also a prayer is inscribed in the window which says, Preserve me, God, for in thee do I put my trust. So, you can see that Christianity was not meant to be separate from government. At all. At all. Alright? So, it's all a lie. Right? So what do we do? Or, or what did they hope to accomplish by this? Well, I think there's, there's two different goals, right? Uh, so it was the establishment of the state as God and provider, which is that little picture that we saw before, and then also to relegate the church of Jesus to a, a shrinking subculture with no voice, no power, and... And that little graphic there with the incredible shrinking church. Uh, that's literally what's been happening. You've seen our voices getting smaller, smaller, and smaller, right? So let's look at this first idea of the establishment of the state uh, um, as God and provider. So um, 
you know, I think the true purpose of removing God from the public space is the establishment of a new God, which is the state. Which is really, as we know, just really another face of Satan, right? Because, you know, he is, a, he is a master deceiver, right? And he is also one that comes as an angel of light. He wants to look like he's, he's good so that he can deceive the masses, right? All right, so in what began in 1947 with that Supreme Court decision has reached a culmination of the secular indoctrination. Now, I found this uh, interesting little... Um, little article that I was reading, and I, I just, I copied a few excerpts from it because I, I think it's fascinating. But the, the guy that wrote this, his name is, uh, it's the ex excerpts from the state as God, and um, he has a website called badquaker.com. So, <laughs> it's kind of funny. But he really quotes, he, he really puts some things together, and I think as you look at this, you'll be able to see that this perfectly describes where we are as a nation and, and, and what's happening. So the state is a mystical, non-human entity that exists only in the agreed minds of humans, fueled by demonic energy, fanatical followers willing to do anything, even kill, to perpetuate their cause. In the U.S., as the power and influence of the church diminished, the power and influence of the state stepped in to fill all the services previously provided by the church. The scholarly leadership in science, culture, law, and economics, and as a side note, you know, all of our major learning institutions um, have, have their, their, um, their roots in Christianity. You know, Yale, Harvard, many others out there all started with, with roots in Christianity where they taught, um, you know, they taught students about Jesus, right? That's where they all started, all right? And so, but they emphasized, you know, um, you know, um, learning, but from a biblical perspective, right? So, but eventually people began looking to the state to define morals and ethics, allowing the laws and regulations of the state to supersede those of the church. Rather than depending on a community's ability to define itself, people allowed the state to sweep in and force all communities to adopt the state's definition of acceptable morals. It is becoming increasingly obvious that the traditional theology is being supplanted with a state-centered religion. The state is or seeks to be godlike in every aspect. It is our protector, our guardian, and for many people, our provider. Information about the state is hidden and secret, while the state itself makes every effort to know every bit of information about us and all of our dealings. All learning flows from the state with schools and media, and it assumes ultimate ownership of all things by its authority to tax, regulate, confiscate, and control the movements and exchanges of all goods, services, and, and property, including people. It assures us that rights are given to us by the state, and the state can take those rights away as it sees fit. It changes and shifts history to fool us into believing that the state has always been and will always be. The state feigns omniscience, seeks um, um, omnipresence, and lusts for omnipotence. Eventually, even the atheist will be denied his logical position of skepticism. How will he shout the challenge, show me your God, when the arm of the state can simply reach out, snatch him away into reprogramming ward, and then the cry of there is no God will become there is no God but the state. And so these are all excerpts that I found from this article, and I thought it was strangely poignant because it actually brings language to some of the things that we're seeing that's going on around us. Now, it's not a benevolent entity called the state. It's not, it's not anything we know because we're Christians and we know what's going on behind the scenes. There is a God of this world and his name is Satan and his act is to destroy God's creation. He knows that he can't win, but he wants to take as many of us as he sees, as he possibly can, all for the simple purpose of hurting the heart of God. Right? And so that's why he wants to destroy us because God created us and he is jealous of us and he wants to destroy God's creation. Okay? And so that's what's happening here. So this is all a plan that's going on to remove the voice of God from the public square. And so um, let's, let's keep going here. So, um, you know, how do we know this? Well, 2 Thessalonians 2 9 through 12. 
The coming of the lawless one will be in accordance with how Satan works. He will use all sorts of displays of power through signs and wonders that serve the lie. What's the lie? The lie is that he is God or that the state is God. You know, really it's him. So we, we know that. And all the ways that the wickedness deceives those who are perishing. They perish because they refuse to love the truth and so to be saved. For this reason, God sends them a powerful delusion so that they will believe the lie and so that all will be condemned who have not believed the truth but have delighted in wickedness. So... We can take comfort in the fact that know that we that this didn't fool God. All right, Satan is trying his last his last stand here to try and take as many people with him as he possibly can. But this was all foreordained by by God. God knew that this was going to happen. You know, but what we need to do, we need to make sure that we're not losing our voice in in the middle of this. So. Um, and then the other thing is the relegation of the church. And so I wanted you to take a look at this. So just a simple, now this is a Google search, right? And so that's why some of these, some of these pictures showed up here. I want you to say this is what steers. When you do a Google search on the separation of church and state, click on images, you'll see that this is what's happening here. You'll, you'll see, you know, keep your religion out of my government, um, you know, um, the separation of church and state, you know, this is not a church. Uh, democracy, not theocracy. You know, never again, you know, talking about the coat hanger, so they're tying it to abortion. You know, build this wall, talking about the separation of church and state. Keep abortion safe and legal and accessible. So it's funny how the narrative gets gets turned on its ear, right? So this is this is, this is is what, what happens. So this is how they want you to think that this is going on, that there needs to be a separation between church and state state. And so, and then of course, you know, they always lie with these, you know, purported facts. New study reveals most Americans support separation of church and state. Yeah. I mean, come on. No, absolutely not. So, and then, um, you know, so, and, and then of course they like to point out that if there's any Christians out there, you know, they're definitely right-winged extremists, you know, who are violent. And so that's the, the other thing that they like to point out. So, um, so as the liberal left is aggressively pushing radical agendas that impact everything from schools to bathrooms, right? Christians may feel like the battle over culture has been lost. The problem is that Christians too often tire of being salt and light and quit altogether in a culture that wages an endless war on biblical truth. We decide that they are beyond help and the world will do what it does, so we back into our church corner people in traditions and all the while the walls keep shrinking. Our children believe the secular teachings and when they grow up they abandon the church. And this is an interesting quote from Lance Walnow. The greatest challenge is for Christians to recognize we are the stewards and curators of our own future in America, that we simply cannot quit fighting for faith. We must boldly live Christ-like lives in the midst of culture, in academia, in media, and in entertainment, and in politics. All right, and that's that's part of, of the solution. And so what happens is when this stuff is going on, we get we get these kind of things that are starting here. Now, these are the extreme positions of what we're seeing happening right right now. There's trying to force our opinion and trying to force us into these into these these things, right? And so um, this is part of the narrative that's that, that that keeps going on and that's trying to force us. Well, I think it's starting to have the opposite effect. I think it's starting to wake people up, right? And so, you know, like especially that one, you know, targeting your, your children, I like that one. So it's like that's exactly what's, what, what's happening. They are targeting our young. And so I think these are actually taking place so that we can, we can see and rise up and it's to provide fuel to understand that we are salt and light. All right. So Christians will pay for lovingly accommodating rather than lovingly resisting those who seek to legislate against biblical values. There's an eerie connection between the new authoritarian model of government emerging and the weakness of the church. As pulpits backed out of the culture war and self-edited their sermons to avoid being controversial, the spirit of lawlessness and authoritarianism forged a perverse new alliance and turned against the church. 
Too many times churches are taking the comfortable position and the separation of church and state uh, and what the separation of church and state affords them. I have seen it time and time again, and I know you have too, where people will say politics in the church does not belong. That is absolutely the place where it does. So it says they will even cite from these pulpits saying that politics have no business in the church. Is this not what Jesus warned about when he said that our lack of impact or salt would lead us to be trodden underfoot of men? Matthew 5.13, you are the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? And is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot. All right, and so that's what's been happening in our churches. We've been having, we've been having this comfortable position saying, well, we don't have to rock the boat because, look, it's against the law anyway, and we're supposed to obey the laws of the land, right? Well, they've been using this, but there is nowhere found in the, com in, in, in the Constitution about the separation of church and state. That is not there. It was always meant to afford, um, it, it, it was always meant to assure that the state would never be involved in the church. That was all it was, it was for. All right, and that was all that uh, Thomas Jefferson was was referring to, and for um, that Chief Justice to pervert that meaning is absolutely unforgivable. So, what can be done? Well, let's just keep reading in Matthew five fourteen. So. Um, you are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand, and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others, that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. So, what's he telling us there? So, we must boldly live Christ-like lives in the midst of culture, in academia, in media, in entertainment, and in politics. Christians have a fundamental duty to infiltrate the culture around us, and the easiest way is to live out our faith boldly in the public square. People are missing the real opportunities to steward the direction of their local sphere by being elected as mayors, school board, uh, judgeships, state representatives, Christians living and working as journalists, filmmakers, business owners, employers, good bosses and co-workers, faithful moms and dads. That's what's going to impact our culture. All right? And so that's what we have to be involved in. We can't just stay in our four walls, right? So Proverbs 28.1, the wicked flee when no one is pursuing them, but the righteous are bold as a lion. Romans 8.31, what then shall we say in response to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? So if God's telling us that we need to be involved, then what are we afraid of, right? So we need to be bold, So, I already read that scripture, so I don't know why I repeated it. But anyway, um, bold as a line, Romans, uh, who would we say? Oh, yeah, so let's just go down. I don't know what happened here, but anyway. Hebrews 13, 6, so that we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper, and I will not fear what man shall do unto me. First, First Corinthians 16, 13, remain alert. Keep standing firm in your faith. Keep on being courageous and strong. Joshua 1.9, I've commanded you, haven't I? Be strong and courageous. Don't be fearful or discouraged because the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. So we have to be bold. We have to be bold. That's what, that's what the Lord is, is doing. And if you're struggling with it, pray for boldness. Acts 4, 28 through 29. But everything they did was determined beforehand according to your will. And now, O Lord, hear their, hear their threats. Give us, your servants, great boldness in preaching your word. Ephesians 6, 19 through 20. And pray for me too. And ask God to give me the right words so that I can boldly explain God's mysterious plan that the good news is for Jews and Gentiles alike. I'm in chains now, but still preaching this message as God's ambassador. So pray that I will keep on speaking boldly for him as I should. So we just ask the Lord. And in Psalms 138.3, on the day I, that I called, you answered me and you made me bold with strength in my soul. 
So what else do we do? We need to preach and teach the word of God, spread the gospel of the kingdom, which is his government, with boldness. Acts 4.31, after this prayer, the meeting, meeting place shook, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. Then they preached the word of God with boldness. And I think that's very important. We have to go out with the power of the Holy Spirit. Acts 4.13, the members of the council were amazed when they saw the boldness of Peter and John, for they could see that they were, ordin that they were ordinary men with no special training in the scriptures, but but they also recognize them as men who had been with Jesus. And I think that's what needs to happen. We need to emphasize our relationships with Jesus. We need to, um, you know, establish that firmly. And then when, when we spend time with Jesus, they can't help but notice whenever you're out there. All right, Acts, 4, uh, Acts 14, 2 through 3. Some of the Jews, however, spurned God's message and poisoned the minds of the Gentiles against Paul and Barnabas, but the apostles stayed there a long time, preaching boldly about the grace of the Lord. And the Lord proved their message was true by giving them power to do miraculous signs and wonders. Nothing speaks like the Lord's power. Philippians 1, 14. And most of the brothers, confident in the Lord by my chains, now dare more greatly to speak the word without fear fear. Amen. So be bold even when the times are hard. 2 Corinthians 4, 8 through 10, we are afflicted in every way but not crushed, perplexed but not driven to despair, persecuted but not forsaken, struck down but not destroyed, always carrying in the body and the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may be manifested in our bodies. 2 Corinthians 6, 4, rather as servants of God, we commend ourselves in every way in great endurance and troubles, hardships, and calamities. Isaiah 40, 31, but those who wait upon the Lord will renew their strength. They will mount up with wings like eagles. They'll run and not grow weary. They will walk and not faint. Luke 18, 1, then Jesus told them a parable about their need to pray at all times and not to lose heart. Psalm 37, 24, though he falls, he will not be overwhelmed, for the Lord is holding his hand. And Psalm 54, 4, surely God is my helper, the Lord is the sustainer of my soul. So we know that when God is moving on us, when the Lord is telling us to do something, that we don't have to worry, we don't have to fear. He will help our boldness. So what is it that we can do? What is it that, that the Lord is, is having us to, to do? Well, I think there's many different things, but I think we can look for ways to be involved in our local community, just as what we were talking about earlier tonight with uh, the Take Action Cherokee. That's one of the ways that we can be in, involved, or even praying for our, our, our local our local uh, community, and, and not to be afraid that when you're out, you know, and you see things that aren't right, speak up when you know they aren't right. So shine your light before all men. Look for opportunities to bring the presence of God into every situation. You know, I know I've talked about this before, but Joanna and I, we, we, we work out at the gym. I cannot tell you the number of times that we pray for people at the gym. And what's so wild is it's just, it's just very natural. When you're out there, God will give you a word. He'll tell you what you need to know in that time and season, and it'll impact someone's life. And they'll be like, oh my gosh, I feel something. I've never felt something something like this before. Nothing can, can um, you know, can dissuade people from an encounter with God, right? And so that's what we, we need to be prayed for. So, and then pray for exposure for the plan of the enemy. We see things that are going on. As we were talking about, this stuff is insidious. It's been going on, but it had the, the sheer purpose of relegating the church to the back door, of keeping us out of the public square. Well, that's not going to happen anymore. We're not going to be out and, and relegated to, uh, you know, to uh, having no voice again. No, we are going to speak out and we're going to be bold. So don't be afraid of the devil's agenda because in the end we know he loses, right? Right? So there is nothing he can do for, do to you except take your life, right? Well, if you're if he takes your life, you're with Jesus. But you know, he cannot he cannot harm one single hair on your head until the purpose that the Lord has for you has been fulfilled on this planet, all right? And so he can't touch you, all right? And then the Lord promised 
promises that he's going to use every situation to work out to our advantage and therefore his advantage, right? And so he's going to use even those things to, to defeat the plan of, of the enemy. And so understand the authority that you have as a child of God. We don't need to be going into these situations any longer with our tails tucked you know, between our, our legs. We need to go in and understand that we have the authority in this in, in every situation because the, the presence of God lives on the inside of us. We have the ability to change. We have the ability to make things happen because we have the words of faith that the Lord has placed inside of us. We can speak and change the very atmosphere. And so then we also need to um, pray for godly men to inhabit government. We need people that understand and have relationships with God to be involved in public office, to understand what, what's going on. And I don't know, um, a, a, lot of, uh, a lot of you know uh, Lynn Saunders, who, you know, we... Um, you know, she re recently ran for office, but she's also been, you know, been heavily involved in the in the community. But these are these are all types of people that need to be involved in local government, and it just exposes everything that's been going on. And so, um, and then we also need to to stay alert. So he's constantly looking for an opening. He's constantly looking for us to be able to take another freedom. He's constantly looking for us to put us back to sleep, for us to, uh, you know, go back to sleep and say, you know, oh, this is just something that is going to be, you know, the Lord's got this. So I don't need to be involved. I don't, I don't need to do it. You know, no, no more. We are not going to do this any longer. So love those around you as God would love them. Don't get baited into fights. Don't get, you know, um, baited into confrontations and things like, like that. Depend on the Holy Spirit to bring change. It's your purpose to love them, right? Not give in, but love them and understand that, you know, Whenever you go to um, whenever you go to fight, you better be sure that it's the Holy Spirit that's leading you to to confront. You don't need to confront unless it's what the Lord's telling you to do. Otherwise, you love people and depend on the power and presence of the Holy Spirit to come in and change things and impact people because that's the thing they can't argue with. When they have an encounter with the Holy Spirit, there is no way they can argue with things like that. And so I love this uh, quote to finish this up uh, by uh, Lance. Wall now, and he says, Christians don't have to be in the majority to shape culture. We just have to engage culture with the power of the gospel. And there is nothing that can overcome the power of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And if we will truly let that sink down into us and understand our rights and our authorities as children of God, then we can overcome and we can make these changes so that our nation is not lost. Now we see the pattern. Now we see what was trying to accomplish. And we've had tremendous victories. I mean, look at the overturning of Roe v. Wade. Look at, the, um, look at the, some of the recent Supreme Court decisions where where they're saying that this undermines the separation of church and state. That's what the that's what the media is, is trying to tell you. But some of the recent decisions, like allowing prayer in the on on, on the football field, you know, uh, those types of things that are actually going on, where they're saying, you know, and allowing allowing states to set their own rights for abortion and and uh, and and things like that. And so we see some of those recent decisions. Those have all been 60 years in the making by a praying church. But it, was, it has been so hard because half of, the, you know, half of the time the church has been asleep during all of this, right? So we don't need to go back to that. You know, it's time. These are our marching orders. These are the last days that we have on this, on this planet. And we need to understand that the Lord has placed us here at this time, this season, for this reason, so that we can accomplish the work that he has for us. So thank you, Lord. And Lord, I just thank you, God. I thank you, God, for what what you brought here tonight, Lord. I just pray, God, that it did open some eyes as far as, far as some of our history of the rich heritage and culture that we have as a, as a nation that was founded under God and on your principles. And so, Lord, I thank you, God, that as we go forth, Lord, we would remember that this is not a secular country. This is a nation that was founded by godly men that wanted to give everyone the opportunity to find a relationship with Jesus Christ. And so, Lord, I just ask, God, that we would not squander, Lord, what has been given to us, Lord, 
Lord, but we would go forth and understand that as children and of the and citizens of the kingdom of heaven, Lord, that we have rights that were given to us by you, God, that we can influence this culture, that we can change the, the tide of what's happening in our country, Lord, and we can go forth in your might and your power in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Thank you, guys.